God is good. And all the time? The title of my message this morning is There's a Gathering Storm. And in relation to the fact that this is uh, Memorial Day, this is not unique to us. This is not unique to this generation. I think every generation of Americans from the beginning until this day has had their day of evil. They've had a day when the storm clouds were gathering. Uh, if you go back to the to the Revolutionary War, you can see, if you'd have been there, you could have seen the storm clouds gathering. And, uh, and they stood up against impossible odds and won independence. And then you have the War of 1812, which was the same thing all over again. It looked bad. Storm clouds were gathering. But the American people rose up people of God rose up. Yeah. And then you had the Civil War. And I was thinking about the Civil War. Being, being a Southern boy, I'm a little disappointed in the way that turned out. But I, but, I, but I have put some thought into why it turned out the way it did. Because, you know, I went to Gettysburg and I looked and I read all the history. Of it. And the truth is, we should have won Gettysburg. If we had won Gettysburg, we would have probably won the war. My Is that better? So I, I, I put some thought into how, how could that have possibly happened? How could God have been on the side of the north? <laughs> and he gave me an answer. The south was constitutionally correct. It, it, it should have been a state's issue. But the south was morally incorrect. And because the South was morally incorrect is the reason they lost that war. But again, the people of God rose up through incredible circumstances, and the, the nation remained intact. And then we had World War I. And then I don't know all that much about World War I, but I've done a lot of studying about World War II. Winston Churchill stood up in the 1930s and said, there's a storm cloud brewing. And this storm cloud will affect human dignity and freedom of religion for generations to come. We must win this war. And then we've had several wars since then, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. Uh, now we've had two uh, wars in the Middle East. Uh, but every time... God's people rise up when the pressure gets the most severe. Can I get an amen? So we have storm clouds brewing, but it is nothing new and it is nothing to be afraid of. Every generation has to stand up and fight for what God has given us. God has given it to us, but the enemy wants to take it away. So we have enjoyed years and decades of and centuries of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, incredible gifts that, that we, even in our Declaration of Independence, we said came from God. They, didn't, they don't come from man, and they don't come because they're written in the Declaration of Independence, and they don't come because they're in the Constitution. They are God-given. But every generation has to fight for what God has given them because Satan wants to steal it. And so the question that Bobby was asking, I think, earlier is, are we going to stand and fight for what God has given us, or are we just going to relinquish it without a squabble? And there's times when it looks like we may be relinquishing it without a squabble, but I don't believe that's true. I believe God's people will rise up. America will once again be great. So if you will turn in your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 18, I'm going to preach 
out of 1 Kings 18 this morning. And I'm going to start in verse 16. So 1 Kings 18, verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and he told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to them, Is that you, troubler of Israel? Isn't it funny how God's man always gets called troubler? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and you have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring, 400, bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and he said, How long will you waver between two opinions? You need to underline that. America, the question to you is, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, then follow Him. And the people said nothing. It got real quiet in the room, just like it gets real quiet at church sometimes. And then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose for themselves, and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, Mila, he is God. I wish I could sing. I'd start singing. Uh, now to lead us. Set a fire. In, come on. He who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them, and they prepared it, and then they called on the name of Baal from, from morning until noon. O oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's asleep and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. And then Elijah said to the people, Come here to me. And they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. <coughs> Underline that. We need to repair the altar of the Lord. Yes. Worship needs to return to the altar of the Lord. Yes. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. It's not enough that he's made an altar and, and not going to light it with fire. He's going to call fire down from heaven. But to make sure they understand that this ain't no trick, this is God, they pour water on top of the offering. And then he says, do it again. And he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. And at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and he prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. 
And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil. And it also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And then Elijah commanded him, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley, and he slaughtered them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. Now, remember, they just came out of three and a half years of drought. So Elijah, there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down on the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told the servant, and he went and looked up. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported back, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. And so Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up the chariot and go down before the rain stops you. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. How foolish do you think it sounded to say, go now before the rain catches you. I want you to notice in the beginning of that as we started reading, who are the people worshiping? Baal. Who is Baal? The worship of Baal is the same as the worship of Satan. I heard a preacher preaching this this weekend, and he said, he said there's four things happen when, when people begin to worship Baal. I want you to write these down. Four things happen when people begin to worship Baal, and tell me if they're not all four happening in the United States right now. The first thing that happens when people begin to worship Baal is they offer their children as sacrifices to Moloch. Since 1973, 50, over 55 million babies have been sacrificed at the altar of Moloch in the United States of America, all under the guise of my choice. <coughs> the second thing that happens when people begin to worship Baal is sexual immorality runs rampant. If we would have been adults, and some of y'all probably were, but if we'd have been adults in the 1960s, I imagine that the people of God were a little bit astonished at the sexual immorality that happened in the 60s. Free love, make love, not war, all that stuff that was going on in the 60s. But I'm telling you today, it is at least 10 times worse today than it was in the 60s. Today, we are flaunting every type of sexual immorality and trying to stuff it down the throats of everybody, even if they don't believe. So the first thing that happens is the people began to offer their children to Moloch as sacrifices. The second thing is sexual immorality runs rampant. Not only is sexual immorality running rampant, but they are trying to force us their lifestyle on every one of us in this country. The third thing that happens when people worship Baal is they become nature worshipers. Hello. We even got a government department, the EPA, environmentalists, uh, I like to call them tree huggers, if you will. They worship nature. Now, see, I think as the people of God, it is our responsibility to take care of the planet. We should do that. But we don't worship nature. We worship the creator of nature. Can I get an amen? There's a huge difference. And the fourth thing that happens when people begin to worship Baal is God's people are persecuted. And so you, 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 that's not in full-fledged at this moment. But their goal is to put the people of God on the run. All four of those are in the process of happening and have been happening in the United States for the last 50, 60 years. And now they are in a place where they feel like they can really push through and push the church out and silence the church of God. Did you know that there are movements in our culture who are trying to get the church to take homosexuality out of the Bible as a sin? Uh, this week I read that the United Methodist Church has decided that they can no longer stand against homosexuality. And so they are going to put their vote in to eliminate a statement in their statement of faith that says, homose right now in their statement of faith it says homosexuality is not compatible with Christianity. Uh, 
they're, there's a, they're going to move to have that stricken from their statement of faith. And so I was talking to uh, Dr. Joel. He's not here this morning. His dad is, is a, a leader in the United Methodist Church, and I'd asked him if he'd heard about it. And so he went and talked to his dad, and he said, yes, he had, and, and that he thought they had enough votes here in the North Texas area to pass that, where that will be taken out. But he said, when they do, I'm going to stand up and, said, and say this. How much will it cost us to rewrite the Holy Scriptures? It took a minute for that to sink in, didn't it? How much will it cost us to rewrite the Holy Scriptures? Great statement. I love Dr. Joel's dad. So, but I want you to see, in, you know, sometimes we read Bible stories and we think, man, that's a great Bible story, but we don't get the context of what's going on. Do you see that when this happened, Israel was in just as bad a shape, if not worse, than we are in America? The people had forgotten God. At least in America, I know full well there's a remnant all over. I don't think you can go into a town anywhere that there's not a remnant of the people of God somewhere in that town. But Israel had turned their back on God as a nation. They're doing what they want to do when they want to do it. And today in America, as a nation, we're doing the same thing. We're taking liberties that were never ours. We're pushing things on people that are not our right to push. Um, basically, we have become a very... And this happens when you, when you get blessed. And each one of us as people of God need to take this into consideration. We need to think about this. When you get blessed, and America is the most blessed nation that has ever been on the face of the earth. But the moment you get blessed, you, have to, you better be prepared for that blessing. And I'm telling you, America has not been prepared for the blessing that God has bestowed on her. Because in our blessing, we have started thinking that it is our own uh, mind, it's our own work ethic, it's our own willpower that created this wealth. I don't know if there's anybody in this room old enough to remember, but you know, if you go back to the, I mean, it ain't been that long ago since the 1930s. And the late 20s and the 30s is when we had the Great Depression. And people that live through the Great Depression, even to this day, are very frugal. Because they remember what it's like not to have anything. They remember what it's like when you didn't throw anything away because we can use that for something. And we're, our generation, we're so blessed, we throw everything away. We get 40,000 miles on a set of tires and that's, that's their limit, we just throw them away. Did you know 90% of the world would, would die to have tires in good a shape as the ones we throw away? Because we're blessed. We throw away all kinds of stuff because we're so blessed. It's nothing for us to go buy another set of tires. So we go buy another set of tires and we throw that set away or whatever. Did you know you can go to Goodwill any day of the week and find brand new clothes in Goodwill? <coughs> How does that happen? Well, somebody give me that as a gift, and I don't really like it. I'm going to give that to Goodwill. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm thankful that we give good stuff to Goodwill and we don't give them our trash. But the point is, we are so blessed, we throw stuff away that other people would die to have. We have no grip of reality in comparison to the rest of the world. We take our drinking water for, for granted. We have clean, even if you don't like your city water, it's still better than what's in 70% of the world. You may not like the taste of it, it may have too much chlorine, but it's clean and it won't make you sick. And if you don't like the water in your town, just go across the border and drink some in Mexico and come back and tell me what you think. <laughs> we take so much for granted in our blessing. And liberties and freedom, we do the same thing with. Very few people in this room really appreciate the First Amendment like our forefathers did. In fact, I doubt if anybody in this room appreciates the First Amendment like the Founding Fathers did. They had never in their life experienced freedom of speech. They had never in their life experienced freedom of worship, freedom of religion. They never had experienced any of the freedoms in the First Amendment or actually in all of, all of the Bill of Rights. 
And the reason they made those Bill of Rights is because they recognized that these were God-given rights and liberties and should always be kept. Now, they gave them to us on a piece of paper. They wrote them down so that they would be handed down from generation to generation. And for 238 years, we've done that. We've, we've, we've passed it down from generation to generation. But we now live in a generation who does not know what it's like to be without those things. And so we've taken them for granted. And so the truth is, the situation in America today is not much different than the situation in Israel was in Elijah's day. And I want you to see how impossible it must have looked to anybody there that day when Elijah walks up as the only representative of God and says, go call all the prophets of Baal. And there's 450 of them. Look, there's probably not much more than 100 people in this room this morning. Can you imagine one guy going up against 450 prophets of another religion? But because Elijah knew God told him to, he had no fear. He walks right up in the middle, calls those 450 prophets, and puts them to the test. They fail the test. God comes through the test. He kills all 450 prophets. What do you think the odds of that were before he got there? Nobody would have dreamed that. Nobody would have thought that. And here's what I'm telling you this morning. God is looking for somebody. Pastor you know, Rob said we need to grow a spine. God is looking for somebody with the courage to believe God and do the impossible. How many of you know God is the God of impossible? The only thing that, that is impossible is the things that are impossible in our minds. And I'm telling you, if you'd have been there, one guy against 450 prophets is an impossible situation. But God is the God of the impossible. And nothing is too difficult for him. Do you believe that? Do you believe it when you walk outside that door today? Or do you just believe it in church when we're all saying the same thing? Remember, church is where everybody, nobody disagrees with me, right? Everybody. But I, I've gone outside and found out there are actually people who disagree with me. I was hurt. God is looking for somebody who's got the courage to stand up in what may seem like, from a human perspective, impossible odds, and declare the glory of God. Will you do it? The reason there's no power in America is because there's no power in the church. There's disobedience in the world because there's disobedience in the church. There is a lack of faith in the world because there's a lack of faith in the church. The president is powerful because the pulpit is impotent. America is off course because the church has lost its sense of direction. As goes the church, so goes the nation. Look around the room this morning. This is the smallest crowd we've had on a Sunday morning in years. You know why? There's two reasons. It's a holiday and it's raining. It don't take much to keep wimpy Christians out of church. Now, I'm preaching to the choir. You're here. So that ain't no reason, no, nobody in here to get offended. You're here. But there's a reason for everybody that's not here to be offended. Now, some of them may have perfectly good excuses. Don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't blame anybody who went to visit their family on Memorial Day weekend. We encourage that. But, but look at how little it takes to keep Christians out of church. Pastor Bobby was saying this morning, this is what God is doing. God is drawing the line. The good news about persecution is it will get rid of all the hypocrites. If you're a hypocrite, you won't stay. You don't want to be persecuted. And if you're riding the fence, you won't stay. You've heard me say this hundreds of times through the years. And, and the numbers are coming down. They're not as high as what I originally started quoting. But if you took a poll in America, close to 80% of Americans would say they're Christians. And yet I think that number is probably 10% or less. 
which means 70% of Americans have deceived themselves into thinking there's something they're not. You're not a Christian just because you're not a Hindu. You're not a Christian just because you're not a Muslim. The only way to be a real Christian is to be born again by the Spirit of God. You have to make Jesus Lord of your life, and you've got to choose to follow Him. And that following Him ain't a half-hearted following Him. Jesus himself said, those who worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. And half-heartedness. No, you don't see that part in there. But how many people in America just go through the motions? They go to church when they feel like it. They read their, well, they never read their Bible. I mean, even, come on, let's be real. Most church people don't read their Bible. If you read your Bible every day, you are ahead of probably at least 98% of people who are in church. And if the church people ain't reading it, the, the worldly people ain't reading it. The Word of God is where the power to change lives is. When you read this, and it's not just reading it, but when you read it and you apply it to your life, listen, Brother Don, I love to memorize Scripture. I think every Christian ought to memorize Scripture, right? But memorizing Scriptures ain't enough. You can have Scriptures memorized from kingdom come. But if you don't do them, it's just words. It has no power. It's when you actually begin to do what God says do. You know, some of the stuff God says do sounds pretty crazy. I mean, I, I've been reading sometimes and I go, man, that sounds impossible. But then I think, God's never told us to do anything that's impossible. So it must be possible. But see, we take most of that stuff like that, and we just... I dare you to try it. I dare you to do it. I dare you to find something that sounds impossible to you in the Word of God and do it and see what happens. I can tell you what's going to happen. When you do it, the power of God's going to fall down. You're going to experience the power of God in your life in that situation. I've got to close with this. I heard a preacher telling, he, he was telling, I think he was at a conference, and he told this story about a dream that he had. And in the dream, he, 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 he was by himself, and he walked into this building, and uh, it was dark. He couldn't see anything. He couldn't see how big it was or nothing. And there was a man who was leading him. And the man who was leading him kind of took him through a door like this. And, and as he walks through the door, uh, you know, he can tell there's a wall here on the side. And so the man leads him to the wall. And it was like one of them, how, how many of y'all remember them old-time tabernacles where they used, you know, used to have revivals and stuff? And they would have windows, and you would push them open and then hold the window open with a piece of wood. Remember that? So he told him to push that window open, he did. And, and so slowly he begins to go around the room. And every time he opens a window, what happens? Light comes in. And then he begins to realize that, man, this is a big room. Uh, this won't just hold 1,000. This may hold 10,000 or 50,000 or 100. This is huge. And so eventually he goes all the way around the room and he opens all these doors, windows. And then when he gets around to this side... He's sitting on the stage, and it was a huge stage, and he hears a sound. Hello? What does Scripture say? There's a sound of a heavy rain coming. And so he begins to look, and he can look through the window that he's opened over here, and he sees it's like they're on an oceanfront property, and he begins to see ships come in. And so the first load of, sh of, of, of the first ship unloads, and the people begin to come into the sanctuary, and they begin to sit down. And he noticed while, while they were sitting down that in the back, it's like there were stadium seats. You know, they were, they were, they were going up, and, and huge, huge. And so all these people begin to sit down, and he says, Lord, who are these people? And the Lord said, those are the pilgrims. Those are the ones that came before you. So then another ship unloads, and they start coming in, and he, well, and when they do, the pilgrims get up and go to the back and start going up that stadium wall. Well, who are these? These are the Puritans. Wow. 
Then the next group comes in. They move to the back. Next group comes in. He said, well, who are these? These are the pioneers. Next group comes in. Who are these? These are the patriots. Just group after group after group of people who had gone before us. And in his dream, this was just in the Americas. The people that came before us, that sacrificed, that gave their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about what the pilgrims and the Puritans went through. Think about what the pioneers went through. Think about what the patriots went through. One of the patriots said, you know, from time to time, the tree of liberty has to be watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants. How much are you willing to sacrifice that the gospel continue to propagate in America? See, I'm telling you this morning, if you're a born-again believer, you're not here by accident. And you may think you're coasting through life. You're not coasting through life. You were, you were born again for such a time as this. There is a purpose that God has in your life. Now, sometimes we may not think it's big enough. You know, I look at Rob, and Rob, I bet Rob thinks sometimes, Lord, what are you doing with me? Got me here in the middle, got me driving a truck. What am I doing driving a truck? But everywhere Rob has gone, and I, I, hear his, I hear his stories. Everywhere he goes, God brings atheists and agnostics to him. Well, what better way to do that than make him a truck driver and send him all over the country? They're everywhere. So don't get disgusted because he made you a truck driver. He made, he made you a truck driver because that's easy transportation to get you wherever he wants you. <laughs> and it's the same way with you. I don't care what you're doing, where you're at. You may think, what, God, what am I doing here? I'm telling you, God has you exactly where he wants you for such a time as this. But you've got to be awake. You've got to be aware. I'm telling you, God is bringing people to you that he wants you to minister to, that he wants you to preach to, that he wants you to present the gospel to, that he wants you to teach and, and mentor. Listen, real change in the kingdom comes painfully slow. I've never known God to wave a wand over somebody and... Boom, they're healed, delivered, and set free. It's a process. Now, he does do miracles. Salvation's a miracle, and it does happen instantly. But how many people you knew, ever known who got born again, and immediately they were a mature, spiritually mature Christian? Doesn't happen. Spiritual maturity comes through discipline. It comes through mentorship. It comes through working and learning to get, and it takes time. But I'm telling you, God has you exactly where he wants you right now. There's a plan and there's a purpose for your life. Don't get discouraged. Don't get down and don't question and don't say, woe is me. Stay positive. Look, when you read the Bible, how many stories of nobodies happen over and over again and God turns them into somebodies? Everybody in here that's a somebody at one time was a nobody. God made them a somebody. And the same thing is true with you and me. We, it's true. We're nobodies. But God is the one who can make us a somebody. Who would have ever dreamed in a million years that a pastor of a small church in Talty, Texas, would be invited to have lunch with the attorney general and the lieutenant governor of the state of Texas? How does that happen? I don't know. I still don't know. And, that, and you know what? That's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? In the big scheme of things, it doesn't mean anything. But there's a reason that God orchestrated. I, there's no other explanation. Because if there's ever been a nobody, I'm a nobody. I felt like a nobody in the room, man. The who's who was in that room. There was only 30 pastors there. But most of them were those guys from Houston. The guys from Houston get it. The guys from Houston are way ahead of everybody else in the state of Texas because they've seen it firsthand. They're awake. Their senses are alerted. This morning, are your senses alerted? Are you awake? Do you understand that God has called you for such a time as this? There's a purpose and a reason for you being here? You know, today's Memorial Day. 
we, we have stopped and we've paused and we've thought about all those who've given their life for our freedom. But I want to tell you, we need to stop and take pause of more than just the soldiers who've given their life. We need to think about the forefathers in the kingdom who've gone before us and laid this ground that have given us what we've been given today. And I'm telling you, you know, I don't want to let the Lord down, but I also don't want to let those down who've gone before me. What I was going to tell you about that dream is they was coming in, you know, and, and every time another group would come in, they'd move to the back, and another group come in. Every group that came in, the group before them would stand and applaud. They were standing and applauding what the next generation did. We did this, but you did this. We did this, but you did this. Every generation was applauding the next one. Wouldn't it be cool to have those that, because you think about who's gone before us. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, um, George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon, which I know he's not American, but you think about all the great men and women who have gone before us in the faith. They made a row. They made a way. And me and you, all of our lives, have enjoyed the freedoms and the liberties that have been given to us by our fathers. I don't want to be a part of the generation that has to tell my kids how it used to be in America. I want to be a part of the generation that says, yes, we did this, but it was worth it for you. And train them to be willing to do the same thing for their kids and their kids. Can I get an amen? I'm going to end with this verse. Acts 26, verse 17. Paul said, God said to Paul, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Listen, God has called us to go and turn them from darkness to light. If you're born again, the light of God lives inside of you.